our favorite folks and then a couple thousand online. Hey, um, hey online people. <laughs> we were kind of joking that, you know, in a way this feels kind of televangelistic, you know, but, <laughs> you know, we're, we are at sort of kind of a, I don't know if it's a kind of a crossroad for the movement, you know, and, and just wondering, before we kick it off, talk about just the working definition of lean startup. Kind of clear it up, let's just get a baseline out there, and then we can start kind of building on and around and off of it. Yeah, you know, it's interesting uh, you talk about the movement, and first of all, hi everybody, welcome, thank you <laughs> uh, for, for having me here. Um, the like formal definition of lean startup, you know, it's called lean from lean manufacturing and the application of the like theoretical framework of lean thinking to the problem of entrepreneurship and innovation. That's, that's the formal definition. But, I, but since you started with the movement, you know, I've been having a lot of conversations with people lately. It's gotten to the point where I have to like, I actually have to tell people that lean startup is not a religion. Which I was like, when you have to, when you have to say something that isn't, if you explain that to people, that's like makes me worried sometimes. And it's like, periodically I'll get a phone call from someone who's like, so and so is blogging something bad about lean startup. You know, like it's, it's they, they're interpreting it wrong. You need to make them stop. And I'm like, first of all, what power do you think I have to like, make someone stop blogging? Do you, you understand how the internet works? I, how, like, I have no, no authority of this person. And, and what kind of person do you think I am that I would want them to stop? Like, go, you don't agree with them? Like, you write your own blog post and explain it. And, and there's all this question, like, well, is that real Lean Startup? Is that official? And I was like, look, the definition of Lean Startup from a, for, a, for a community and a movement like us is whatever works. So if it works, then we want to incorporate it into Lean Startup. If it doesn't work, we want to reject it. And even if you read it in the book, or even if like so-and-so famous person says it's a good idea, like if it doesn't actually work, we have to get rid of it. Because if, with these kind of movements and these ideas, like if they don't evolve themselves, they die. And, and they actually become worse than dead. They become the living dead. They become ossified in a kind of like bunch of slogans that, that enable people to do dumb things. So I don't want that to happen to us. Well, it's interesting to hear the dyna dynamic aspect of, of Lean Startup. And, Wondering, you know, do we need different filters depending on startup versus enterprise, technology versus manufacturing? Are there kind of different applications and, you know, kind of using the biblical reference once more, <laughs> you know, exegesis? Are, are, this, are this we to, are we to read this, yeah. um, out of the text differently depending on our vantage point? Yeah, as, you know, I, I've, I've never found this confusing, but I, I see that a lot of other people do, which is at the level of principles, things can be universally or broadly applicable, but at the level of specific tactics, they cannot. So, you know, the, the, the scheme of Lean Startup, which is say, look, if you, whatever your strategy is, whatever you believe is gonna work in your business or startup, all I'm saying is let's put that to the test and find out if it's really true. First of all, I never imagined when I first started saying that that could be controversial to anybody. It seemed like the most obvious thing you would say. It's like, use science and don't use astrology. <laughs> that, I was like, like in a technology <laughs> business, that would be an easy one for people to be like, oh yeah, we probably should do that. But you know, you I have mean learned it's the not hard a geocentric universe. Yeah, it's like <laughs> I've learned the, learned the hard way. There's still people who believe you can predict the future with great accuracy, and if you use your mind and willpower, you can like manifest things in the world, which you know usually you only see that on late night TV. Anyway, um, <laughs> what what happens is people then say, well, you know, minimum viable product means like just shipping some like crappy landing page or an app. But like that wouldn't work like, you know, for a, for a car. Therefore, like that's not possible to apply lean startup in that domain. And in the early days, when I, my background is in software. So what people used to say like, oh, if you're trying to cure cancer or you're doing rocket ships or something, like you can't, you can't use lean startup. And I used to agree with those statements and be like, sure, because I'm just, in those days, I was just trying to get people in Silicon Valley to like stop wasting tens of millions of dollars building their crappy app. And I was like, if we could just, if we could just get that done, that would be a pretty big change. That's all I was thinking about. So I was happy to concede uh, from a theoretical point of view that like, okay, probably there are all these other businesses that doesn't apply. And it's funny, I've gone back and looked at old stuff I've written. Every single one of the cases I said, it definitely can't apply here. I now know someone who's applying it in that case. I mean, including people working on curing cancer and, and rocket ships and like every crazy thing that you can, I would have said, oh, probably doesn't apply there. Air, you know, airplane engines and you, you name it, people are, are applying these ideas. And it's because the general framework you know, is, is in fact broadly applicable. But I think the reason people have a hard time with this is uh, it requires thinking for yourself, which people don't really like to do. So like, I, I've kind of now have an appreciation for the fact that like, there's a lot of people who would really prefer just, you know, tell me what to do and then like, I can decide if it applies to me or not. But they don't want to actually have to do that, that thought translation of, hey, this worked in this business. Like, what is, what is the generalizable lesson from that versus I just copy what that person does and like, boom, I instantly get rich and, and famous. So you, you talk about kind of people struggling just with the premise. Let's say I've accepted the premise, I've bought the book, I put it on my desk, I'm hoping through osmosis, 
I'm going to absorb the idea. Totally. If you just buy the book, everything gets it's instantly better in your You've life. You've got plenty of books, by the way, here. Sit. I think some no, people it's not are, a big deal. are even holding it close to themselves, like if it microwave. Doesn't, if it didn't work for you, you probably just didn't buy enough copies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but really, where do you see people consistently struggle? And more so, in that struggle, where, how are people breaking through that? Well, there's a lot of excuses. I mean, behavior change is hard. I was, someone said on Twitter, which I thought was so great, like the two things people complain about, the way things are and change. It's like, yeah, that's so right on. <laughs> yep, that, yep, the status quo is terrible, but change is really painful. So, so actually deciding, you know, like actually deciding to take action and to apply it a framework like this. And I've been saying in my talks and in the book, I said it as many times as I possibly could. This is not something you should take on faith. You can't be like, this is a scientific approach and you should take it on faith. Like you have to prove it to yourself. So the number one thing I think people get hung up on is they want to argue about whether it's applicable or argue about whether it's right or not instead of just putting it to the test themselves. And I just like push people, like just whatever you believe, including Lean Startup is stupid, let's prove it. If, you're, if that turns out to be true, if you run an experiment and you discover that something I recommend is a bad idea, like I'm the most enthusiastic person on the planet to find that out. I'm always looking for ways to improve, you know, improve what I believe and improve what, what works for me. And, and yet, a lot of the time I spend with companies and with startups, you know, people want to argue about like, oh, you can't do any startup if the, you know, it could have negative effects on your brand or competitors are going to steal your idea. And it's like, do you have any idea how hard it is to get someone to steal your idea? <laughs> like, it's my favorite homework assignment to give entrepreneurs. Like, go try to get an idea stolen. Like, go find the relevant product manager at a big company who should be stealing your idea. Don't give them your best idea, but like, every entrepreneur has like 10 awesome ideas. So like, pick like number six. Go get it. Like, write a memo. Send them your business plan. Like, <laughs> what do you bribe them? Like, it's really hard. And but because like the truth is, you think that product manager never had your idea? Your idea is so great, no one's ever thought of it before. Of course, they had your idea. The problem is not that they couldn't think of your idea. The problem is they have no mechanism for translating that idea into reality because they're stuck in some god awful bureaucratic megacorp. So, like, why are you afraid that the bureaucratic megacorp can out execute you? If that actually is true, like, you suck so bad. You're so doomed. You know, not. Not you, of course, but maybe you have a friend. <laughs> anyway, so, so like... You, you talk about megacorps. Yeah. Right? And, you know, what, what pie-shaped percentage of adopters or, you know, disciples of Lean Startup are actually coming from the enterprise, do you, would you wager? Oh, well, this has now gotten crazy. So, like I said, I, I started out talking about startups in Silicon Valley, but in the book, I made the, like, theoretical argument, a deduction from first principles, that a startup is a human institution designed to create something new under conditions of extreme uncertainty. And for more than five years now, I've been saying, therefore, these ideas don't have anything to do with the size of company, sector, or industry. But the first time I said that out loud, I didn't know if it was actually true or not. It just seemed true to me. I was like, I don't understand why people segment practices by company size when uh, if the second you have even one customer, you immediately have the, big, the so-called big company dilemma of should I invest in my existing customer or new customers? And as soon as you have multiple teams, you have to deal with departments and inter-team coordination. And, and like, let's just call it what it is. That's a management challenge, and entrepreneurship has to be a kind of management. There's really no way to get around that. Um, but I didn't really think anyone was going to take that seriously. So I just put it out there and figured what's the worst that can happen. And right away, people started coming up to me after talks and saying, hey, I, I'm a general manager at a big company. And, you know, I accept your challenge. And the first time that that happened to me, I was like, what challenge? What are you talking about? And they're like, well, you said this could work in my business, so I'd like to like, put it to the test and find out. And the first time that happened to me, I was like, best of luck. Great, good luck with that. Like, that's really not my department, but I hope that it goes well for you. And I was lucky that it was some very far-sighted general managers in some pretty big companies that kind of dragged me to say, no, actually, there's something interesting for you to learn here, and go, go take a look. And what, what I learned the hard way is that, first of all, in any organization of any size, there's already entrepreneurs working there. So I would have said, if you, you know, in these bureaucratic big companies, there are no entrepreneurs to be had, and that's the problem. But if you believe that, you're just flat out wrong. I, I've seen it. Just the law of large numbers says there's going to be some incredibly incredible entrepreneurial talent stuck in these companies. And the problem is not the talent. The problem is the systems that the company uses are antiquated and prevent people from, from being creative. And what that has done is created this really strange thing in the Lean Startup movement. If you come to the Lean Startup Conference or you know, come to most events, am I guessing even tonight, you will have like a really unusual mix of technical and non-technical, big company and not, you know, and, and like kind of garage startup type people that they don't come together that often. So it's actually, we tend to attract an unusual audience of folks who don't think of themselves as having much in common. But the big thing that I have learned doing this work now a few years is that we have more in common than we think. And there's actually a, a lot of best practices that can be shared 
uh, across company boundaries and even into governments and NGOs and all kinds of different contexts. Because basically, if you don't know what you're talking about, you don't know what's going to happen in the future, then you're an entrepreneur no matter what it says on your business card. So um, anyone who, who has that same problem is actually your comrade in arms, whether you recognize it or not. So in terms of the movement, now 2009, we're, what, six years in. If we think about the origins of, of some of the great processes that have been institutionalized, operationalized, you've got Taylor with you know, scientific management, you've got Toyota and total quality management, Six Sigma. Each of those have a great poster child. You've got Ford, GE, yeah. Walmart. What's the poster child of lean startup six years in? You know, I have learned to resist the overwhelming temptation that all consultants and business authors have to name names. And, you know, I would love to tell you that every great company that you admire uses Lean Startup. And in fact, if you read a lot of business books, like every company, like, it's like Southwest does everybody's thing. And like Apple is always an example for everybody. And it's just like, first of all, I don't want to speak for anybody else. So what I would say is we put on a conference every year. Uh, we invite companies, large and small, to come speak in their own words about what they're doing. Because then people, like, you name a company, like, well, is that really Lean Startup? It's like, if it was a religion, I could tell you. But it's not, so think for yourself. <laughs> we put the videos of every person who's ever spoken at the conference online for free. You can, you can watch, you can see the case studies, you can look at the logos and the fancy companies. And the, we have a lot, of, a lot of companies that, like, when they presented at the startup, were a 25-person company that are now, you know, many thousands of employees. So, like, there, there are the success stories, but... So no names. Like, but, just, but like, I didn't, like, like if you were to give a Webby-type award any that really stand out, or maybe the ones that surprised you the most? One they're like, really? Like, they're using it? Yeah, you know, I, I only like to talk about the work that I do myself. So, so I've worked with a number of companies and have been really surprised by what I've learned by working with them. So like, uh, this year is kind of, people are starting to get the word that like GE, I mean, we have some, I have some friends from GE here, that have done, you know, what's gotta be the world's largest installation of Lean Startup intentionally. You know, I've worked with them to train thousands of their top managers and have personally worked on tons of their products. And what I, I love about that, like that was a very surprising example to me. If you told me five years ago I would be doing kind of like a Six Sigma scale um, project with a company like G, I would have told you that, that you're crazy, you're smoking something weird. <laughs> well, um, I mean, they, they famously have Jack Welch and Six Sigma in the 80s and, and yeah. further. Does it come into opposition with or does it work nicely well, or that's is it just so, applied in different departments? Well, that's what's so great about um, working with companies that are well run, that are well disciplined, that have a history of having done these kind of changes before is, uh, as an outsider, it really puts you to the test. So like, when you, like there's, there's knowing enough to write a book about something, which people think that makes you an expert. But honestly, when I think about what I knew when I wrote this book compared to what I know now, I'm like, wow, I can't believe that actually worked out okay. Like, you <laughs> dodged the bullet there. Like, wow. I, it, until you have faced the firing squad, like I went through a six month period at GE where uh, I went, I traveled to every business every functional group, like every part of the company and did a training for their most senior managers. So like CEOs of business units and their direct staff, the top, really the top folks. And until you have like sat in a room with, you know, 20 to 40 super senior executives who are, who could not, I mean, these are people who are very powerful people in business. They're super smart and they are really skeptical. It's their job to be skeptical. Some Silicon Valley dude showing up to like tell them what to do. Like you can just imagine looks on their faces and try to convince them, it, it's really like, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, one person at a time, that this is a good idea, and you have to be ready to answer their questions. It really felt like facing the firing squad every time. And if you're doing a workshop like that, if someone asks you a question you can't answer, the workshop's basically over, right? So like, you know, if you get a question, it's like, well, how's this gonna affect the GE brand, or how's this gonna affect our shareholders, or how's, you know, how are we gonna do this in this kind of engineering situation, or what about regulatory compliance? What about supply chain? What about, what, you know, what about labor contracts? I remember the first time I got that question, I was like, uh. You know, like, okay, like, we need to answer those questions. And it, you know, it's like a crucible for really forging, like, do you really know what you're talking about? And does, does the, the theory really stand up to scrutiny? And I, you know, I, what am I going to say? But, oh, no, it didn't. Of course, like, I think it came out great, and it's, it's been good for them. And, and you'll see that they're doing more public stuff lately to kind of share what their experience has been of it. But what that, that really cured me of the idea that it can only be applied in certain situations or certain, I mean, they're, that's such a, a multi-industry, multi-sector conglomerate. Um, that, that, you know, that was, that was really interesting. But it was also very surprising because I, I really would have said that their problem was like that the people are bureaucratic. So that's why they go slow. And like I have really come 180 degrees around on that, that the system can be bureaucratic, but the people are actually quite exceptional. 
And it's so cliche to talk about like unleashing people's creativity that like I, I hesitate to even say it. But I have sat in the room, I mean I can't tell you how many times now I have sat, not just at GE, but with a lot of companies where you have somebody who before given the opportunity to work in this new way is considered by their peers and colleagues a like really nasty, negative, slow like person who would just like hates innovation and is always trying to kill things. And to watch them go in a relatively short time to like someone who truly has that entrepreneurial spirit. I, I've had multiple people ask me, like, did you put something in the water at the <laughs> workshop that caused this like personality transplant for this person? Because it seems so striking. We think as human beings, it's a well-documented kind of fallacy in psychology. We think we know someone's essence when we meet them, we see their behavior. And we don't realize how much of people's behavior is circumstantial and driven by the conditions of the systems that they find themselves embedded in. And so, uh, what the, my biggest surprise is like there's an incredible latent energy and creativity and talent out there in, our, in the workforces of companies of all sizes. And it is possible to unlock it if you make the right interventions. And that's, I mean, that's just personally very exciting to me. So thinking about different frameworks and kind of metaphors, we kind of shelved the religion one. We're not Thank a religion. You. What about thinking about this? I just saw it straight out of Compton. So I'm thinking uh -huh. kind of rap. We're in the, we're in the studio. Um, collaborations. You know, you, I don't know if you see of yourself as like a Dr. Dre or a Snoop Dogg, but who, who do you like to collaborate and put, put tracks down with? Are you a, a solo artist or? Oh God, I'm not even cool enough to know how to answer that question. <laughs> that kind of culturally of appropriate. Yeah. I know, I'm like, hi everybody, I, I, my pop culture literacy is, is poor. Uh, um, no, but no, within the industry. But I, but like, I understand what you mean. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, like I personally am very introverted and I find doing this kind of work like very draining and very difficult. So I'm not the like buddy buddy, collaborate with everybody, like do things together. Like it's, it's, it takes a lot of energy for me to trust someone enough to want to collaborate with them. Um, I'm much more of like open source believer. I mean, I was like a you know, free software foundation like licensing volunteer back in the day, for those who know what I'm talking about. Like I really believe in the power of ideas um, to spread you know, in a peer to peer way without restriction. And so I have tried really hard rather than to collaborate with everybody to create a framework that invites many people into the movement, into the community. And what's funny about that is, first of all, I, every, like, every, almost every day now someone's like telling me, hey, so-and-so's ripping off your ideas, aren't you mad about it? And I'm like, oh, are they using them correctly? If the answer is yes, then like, fantastic. But may they, may they live long and prosper and make a ton of money. <laughs> what is uh, correctly? Well, right, so like, that's the thing. If, they, if, they are, if they're being true to the principles, if they're authentically trying to apply it in their business, then, then they're my comrade. That's really how I feel about it. Well, we're all here somewhat as disciples and evangelists. What, See, what are... you're using those bad <laughs> words again. That's like okay, trying to get fans. But yeah. We're, but red light, green light. What, anything you want to clear up in terms of the principles? What are the, some of the most fundamental principles, the bedrock that we should continue to do? And what are some things that are just, just flat out wrong or slightly misunderstood that you'd love to clear up tonight? Well, here's the one that's on my mind a lot these days, which is there's this issue, interesting uh, interrelationship between long-term, short-term, and lean startup. So a lot of people, it doesn't tend to be people who read the book, to be honest. It tends to be people who learned about it secondhand, or third-hand, or eighth-hand, or I don't know how, you know. So, like, so the people who, who write these posts are like, MVP is all about sloppy work, and like just putting crap out there and seeing what sticks. And, um, you know, like, uh, there's a common criticism going around now that's like, lean startup is about asking customers what they want and doing what they say. And I, got, I was doing an, an AMA on some site, and I, keep, I get this question so often, I finally lost my temper, which I you should not, really never do on the internet, it's a huge mistake. Uh, and I was like, I'm gonna, I actually pulled up a copy of my own book, which I never do. I was like, I'm gonna find the page on which I addressed it, this is this, like, but I told people this is not what I believe. And I had, to, I had to flip to page nine. And it's like right there, it's like, and this is not about listening to customers and doing what they say. So I was like, anyone who read at least the first nine pages, for God's sake, how can you be asking me this question? But you don't do that on the internet because it goes badly. It does not go well. This is not a good. I'm going to show you kids. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. You know, Get I, off I, my I really lawn. I, and as soon as you're quoting your own book, like you, you're a total <laughs> you asshole. Yeah. Just, it's bad. Don't do that. Um, but like, it's frustrating because people think that this is about like the quick wins. And so there are some people I think who see the kind of culture of startups during the boom times. People start to get build stuff to flip, and there's all this kind of like froth and noise and energy, and people think that lean startup is, is philosophically aligned with that. When in fact. Those of us who've been in this movement know that um, you know, we're really opposed to that. And the reason is, the whole point of things like MVP is to sustain energy and patience over the long term. So my belief is anyone who doesn't truly have a long term philosophy of company building is not going to have success with Lean Startup. And in fact, um, they're going to be very unhappy with the results that they get. If you're just trying to do something small, if it's something minimum, 
then you don't need minimum viable product. Just go do minimum product and leave us alone. Like if, but if we're testing to experiment to discover your, which of your hypotheses are right and wrong, that's because you recognize that whether you choose to or not, everything you do is an experiment that's only one component of your larger vision. It's an admission of humility to say it's impossible. People think, well, why don't you just wait longer and ship the perfect product, as if there's such a thing as a perfect product. Every, every product is a work in progress, and every product needs to be continuously improved to get to that vision state that we all, uh, that we all want. So, and, and the flip side is also really interesting. So um, I think it requires a long-term philosophy to do something like lean. It's actually a, a lesson I learned from the lean manufacturing movement. They really believe in long-term thinking. It's the foundation of everything that they do. Um, the flip side is also true. The people who are the most short-term in their thinking actually wind up doing the most slow, bureaucratic, waterfall-style projects. Like, where, where are the worst offenders of those kind of projects? They are in the, like, product development organizations of big, big, big public companies where people are, like, trying to, like, hit the quarter. Everything's all about the quarterly report. And the, the conservatism that that breeds makes people extremely risk-averse to try new things. It makes it very hard. And we can talk into the, like, you're interested in the systems and budgeting problems and the reasons why they can't do an MVP. They can't do anything quick. Everything has to be massive. And so they can only do a small number of politically correct mega projects. And those mega projects run into what they call in the manufacturing world the large batch death spiral, my favorite buzzword of all time, where once you get a project to a certain size, uh, everyone's incentive flip from shipping it to making it bigger. It's like, well, we'll just add one more thing, right? Because we want to make it a little bit more perfect. And we, wanna, you wanna, we don't want to risk the whole project because it's missing this one feature, so better wait a little bit. And it's like every time you wait, it's like, well, now that we have more time, we can add one more feature. And then you're late. And you, you, guys, you guys have lived through this. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. So... That is actually a product of short-term thinking. It produces these really long-term, like, death march projects. And so I think that's something that's, that's a little bit subtle that, that people don't understand about Lean Startup, and they think we're aligned somehow with short-term thinking, but it, I think it really is the reverse. So let's just say there's a change agent or two watching tonight. Hi, change agent. Yeah, <laughs> Doing the large batch death Spir spiral, 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 spiral yeah, LBD, not little black dress, but LBDS. Yeah. <laughs> what, what advice do you have for that? poor soul who does want to make a difference and maybe is in a position in a decision making budget, you know, yeah. maybe there's a, a turnover of totally, staff. Totally. What, what do they do? What, it's what funny. Are some of the I, I, Other I, than get the book, what do they do next? Yeah, well, that <laughs> book is, you got bigger problems and the book is going to be able to help you with. I mean, I, I'll just give you an example. I was, a team approached me that was um, something like 17 out of 18 months into a massive like $100 million product development effort. Total number of customers contacted during this time is zero. Um, they are about, that's like, they are T minus 30 days from a mega, mega launch, you know, huge press, Super Bowl ads, like the full, you know, the full work, like every mistake you could possibly make. And the people who make those plans, at some level, even though it's like impolitic to admit it, like they know that there's a problem. And they, you, know, they, you can see in the face of the people who are in the death march that like they know this is not going to go well. But of course, you can't ever say that to your colleagues, you'd be accused of sabotaging the thing. And the first person who says anything negative will be the person blamed when it doesn't go well. It's like, if you hadn't made that negative comment, this thing would have worked, but since, so it's always your fault. So no one wants to say a thing. And my view as a coach, I, I work with a lot of teams as, their, as a kind of coach and advisor is like, it's never too late. Like there's no such thing as too late for a lean startup. As bad as the situation is now, you can always make it better. Even a tiny bit of testing will go a long way. And I was, I remember talking to this team, I was like, listen, Let's say that, and they were like, the, the train has left the station, the, the ad campaign cannot be stopped, this launch is going to happen, and we're worried about it. I was like, okay, even if that's true, if this launch is going to be a total disaster, if you know that today versus 30 days from now, that's, that's still better for you. So you can still do an experiment. It's like, can we do an experiment this weekend? Can we go get one customer right now for this product? And just, like, just double check that everything's going to be fine. I'm sure it is. You know, I, I'm, I, I, the great thing about that as a coach, you can be the most optimistic person in the room. It's like, I'm sure this launch is going to be a mega success. So what could it hurt to double check? Right? Like, what's the harm? It's all, the, the tests are going to come back all super positive. So you've spent $100 million on this thing. So that they're not going to come back mediocre positive. They're going to come back ultra positive. In fact, I might go so far as to say that of the 10 people we do the experiment with, all 10 are going to want to buy this product. Like, no one's more enthusiastic than me about this plan, so let's go do it. So that you get to be... The positive, so like if, I'm that, if I'm in that situation, that's what I recommend. Be the super positive person, and let's just, let's just go double check. And if, as in this particular case, you go to 10 customers and ask them to buy this product, and you're only asking them to pre-order it one month early, so it's not even like a complicated MVP to do, and you get, for example, zero out of 10 customers want to buy it. And in fact, it's more like negative one, because one of them tried to punch you in the face because the product was that bad. Um, 
even though you felt like the train was going to leave, there's nothing you could do about it, there actually is something you could do about it. Because now you have some facts that the other people in the organization don't have. And so before, you were just having a philosophical debate about ship, don't ship, spend the money, don't spend the money. But now you have facts. And in some organizations, nobody cares about the facts. But I think even in a lot of bureaucratic and organizations that have kind of gone down a bad road, they're still very results oriented. And so if you can go to the right decision maker and say, listen, or, or even better, if you're the decision maker and you have the facts, you can say, you know what? Even though we've had a huge sunk cost, and even though we've wasted a lot of money on this project, we're still spending money every day. So every day sooner we stop is money saved that we could use to reboot. And you know, I, what I would say is have the courage to pull the plug and, re, you know, and, and do the pivot. The, the more sunk cost you have, the longer you've gone, the more psychologically invested you are in that momentum, the harder it is. But it's never impossible, it's never too late. You, you, can, you can make a change. I always think about water world when you talk about sunk costs, <laughs> right? Would Hollywood benefit from you know, some of the, the movies, possibly? Anybody in the entertainment industry you know uh, of? There, there, there is actually there's like a little nascent lean filmmaking uh, uh, a community, and those who are interested can, can look it up online. Um, I think it, I mean, first of all, how much worse can it get? So let's at least try it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it seems very straightforward to me because in artistic and creative enterprises especially, it really is very binary whether people respond to the concept or not, and it's, it's often possible. Like, it's, it's, it's rare that there's something that can't be tested, you know, and that's why on TV they do pilot episodes, and, you know, and a lot of times there's like a mini pilot even before the pilot, and there's even a teaser or a trailer. Like, there's a lot of little things that you can do to get a sense of, like, are we on the right track? And as soon as you start to talk to really creative people about that, you know, they can start to get confused. Like, oh, no, this is going to be like, you can do a screen test and ask the customers what my movie should be, and it's all going to be fart jokes and stupid, you know, like, it's going to be the lowest common, like, I, people, I, I understand that concern and that fear. But if you really take a scientific approach, what you say is, let's produce, if we don't have the budget and the funding to produce 180 minutes of, like, a really edgy avant-garde content, let's produce two minutes of something and use that to see if people want the next two minutes. And what's exciting about that is that allows you to be way more avant-garde in those two minutes than you otherwise would have been able to do once you've raised a bunch of money from investors who have a natural conservatism. So I think that's true in publishing. It's true in, in all forms of media. I, I think it's actually a very, um, it has a lot of opportunity to bring some business literacy and kind of control of the business into people who have today a creative job. And I think the traditional system has very much tried to separate business from creativity. And that has wound up kind of infantilizing a lot of creators and made them kind of victims of the system rather than empowering them to, to do things that they really want to do. You mentioned a little bit about funding. And in preparation for tonight, t sat down with a few people, put in a couple million dollars in the various companies. And they said, you know, I've, I've read Lean Startup. I, I mostly get it. But in some ways, it is opposed to the way I look at investments, which I want certainty. I want a really clear roadmap. I want things mapped out. I want, you know, I even think about some of the um, manufacturing standards that someone like Intel needs to have a seven-year roadmap with 98% certitude. Yeah. So is it a false dichotomy to say, okay, well, we've got the funders who need these things and you've got the most, you know, yeah. minimum waste, super efficient. How do you reconcile that, if at all? Yeah, I think that it does have implications for investors and for their behavior. Um, and I think the best investors kind of do it naturally. That they, they understand that the way you measure progress of a startup team is not about the artifacts that they produce, but like all the progress is between the ears of the people. It's like it's really about what have they learned and what have they figured out. That's you know, and every all the like metrics and, and accounting of lean startup is all just like how do we put a number to that question? How do we prove that someone has really learned? Unfortunately, the way most investors evaluate that today, it's pretty gut instinct and kind of snap decision. Like it's, and the people who are good at it have developed a really deep, uh, intuitive understanding of what progress looks like. And those of us who have studied intuitive decision making, like you know that the human brain is incredible at a lot of things and intuition is very powerful, but it is also susceptible to bias. And I think that gives you an explanation for why the venture capital industry looks the way that it does. And that's something that I think a more meritocratic decision making process could improve. But that's a whole other topic for maybe a whole other occasion. Uh, but a lot of investors are not that good. And they're asking for things that don't make sense. Now, when I was an entrepreneur, what I just assumed is that like, things like roadmaps and spreadsheet forecasts about the future and like, business plan artifacts, I didn't understand what they were for. 
I just assume that like investors kind of ask you to do something painful to prove that you're tough. It's like if they asked me to like cut myself and like bleed for them <laughs> like, to prove how long, like that's kind of how it felt to me. I was like, oh, you want me to like make a spreadsheet? Like that sucks, but I'm tough. I'll show you that. But like then like it was a shock to me. I once had an investor that took a spreadsheet that I gave them and then like later on called me up and said, hey, how's the business going? I said, it's going great. We're learning this thing, that thing. It's going really well. And he's like, well, it said in the spreadsheet that on this month, such and such thing would happen. And I'm like, it did? You, you read that thing? <laughs> you thought I was predicting the future with that? I made that the night before for you because you said to make it. I, haven't, I certainly haven't looked at it since. No one in the company, like how many people in your company have read your business plan? I mean, it goes into a shelf and you're like, well, okay, I did that stupid thing. And of course, investors don't realize that that's what's going on and that creates a lot of tension and conflict. So but no the, business plan, no spreadsheet? Well, I'm very pro business plan. I may be the last person in the startup world who's like super pro business plan, but not the pros fiction writing part of the business plan. We can throw that out. That's just worthless. The spreadsheet that you produce, I think, is actually super powerful because it allows us to translate the concept of leap of faith assumptions and like what really has to be true for the business to work into quantitative terms and that can give rise to a whole new accounting paradigm. We call it innovation accounting for, for quantify, quantifying the learning progress that startups are making. But most investors are not with that. Like that's a very avant-garde concept in the investor community. You know, I remember I was sitting with one very famous VC and trying to pitch them this idea. I said, look, this is a more meritocratic way of making decisions. It can help you figure out who in your portfolio is really making progress and who's just doing success theater and, and you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and they just were very negative about it, just like not, not getting it, not getting it. And, they, and the best I could get them to concede was they were like, well, if that was possible, it would, we would make a lot of money. Like, that would be a really good thing. But it's not possible. I was like, okay, well, I, and I thought what he meant was, well, let's go run an experiment to see if it's possible. But what he meant was, get out of my office. I've had enough of this conversation. <laughs> I've, you know, I've already made a billion dollars, so what do I need you for? I was like, okay, well, fair enough. But I do think that like, the new breed of investors who have kind of come up in this generation are much more, like, they talk more about traction than about any of the concepts we're talking about. But they're starting to get more quantitative. I think they have a desire to be more meritocratic in their decision making. And I think they're starting to realize that many of the artifacts that you're just trained to ask for as an investor really make no sense. Like the roadmap is my favorite. And it's like, why do you need to know what the founders think they're going to be releasing to the public 18 months from now? First of all, the one thing we know for sure is that whatever they tell you is not going to happen. So what is the purpose of the roadmap? And if it's, you know, it's just a thought exercise to help learn how the founder thinks, that's a fine thing to do. But then if it's a thought exercise, the next day, you should rip it up and throw it out and never look at it again, which is what the founders are doing. If the investor is keeping it and thinking, okay, I'm going to judge success now by is the company sticking to its roadmap? You know, it goes back to that classic question I ask all the time. If we're building something that nobody wants, why would we be on pr so proud to do it on time and on budget? It's like we're driving a car off a cliff and bragging about the gas mileage. Like, amazing. <laughs> we're going so fast, right off this cliff. Like, it doesn't make sense. So I think people are starting to get it, but... You know, uh, there's so much money to be made, especially in good times like this, like, you know, kind of doing things the conventional way that I think it, will, it may take another downturn before this gets really deeply entrenched in the investor community. So I want to hop in the hot tub time machine. We're going to make three stops. The first stop I want to make is the first bubble. Pets.com. Sure. The 90s. If you could go back then, what, what are some of the main things that you would change about the thinking and the way that people were approaching. Oh, <laughs> just, just a couple. Listen, I, I was in the dot-com bubble. I did it. I, re I did a startup for my college dorm. I didn't know what a startup was. I didn't know what, I didn't know anything about business, but I saw on TV that like all these kids are walking into venture capital offices and walking out with $10 million checks and you know, if you have a good idea, you can make, get rich. And in fact, I had a great idea. I had this business idea. See if this sounds familiar to you. We created a website where students from top elite universities could create online profiles for the purpose of sharing. <laughs> As it turned out, that did turn out to be a pretty good idea, but we were so stupid and knew so little about what we were doing that we thought that technology should be used for students to create resumes to share with employers. And if someone actually got on a time machine and went back and explained to me the concept of Facebook, I would have been like, that's stupid. I'm trying to create a real business here. Like, don't waste my time with this, like, <laughs> social whatever. Like, you know, like, I, was, I thought I knew what a real business looked like. It sounds kind of Reed Hoffman-esque with, with LinkedIn, no? <laughs> well, right. I mean, it could have been. could have been. If we had any competence at all, you know, all kinds of good things could have happened. But we didn't know the first thing about how to create a business. Um, and luckily for us, actually, the dot-com bubble crashed. All our investors went out of money, and we were totally destroyed. I say luckily because, although it was incredibly painful and depressing at the time, it was like, I mean, this is not a like aqua hire, like sort of a success. This was a catastrophic startup failure, the kind that like 
you don't see so much anymore. Um, in retrospect, if the bubble had gone on longer, we would have been in the land of the living dead longer because we were doomed from the start. We made consequential strategic errors in the way that we approached it. Um, but the money was flowing and you know, when money is easy, uh, all kinds of mistakes can be hidden and I think we could have gone for even longer. So we're like, in some ways very fortunate uh, that we flamed out. Although if we went back in the time machine and told my you know, 20 year old self that story, they would, they would not be very eager to, to hear about that. So before we go impressive. forward in time, yeah. I would want to know, kind of, Eric, when you're younger, were you just super into those scientific boards with those three panels and you were testing photosynthesis? I mean, science oh, seems science like Oh, science fair. Oh, yeah, that like, was me. What are some of like, the early science projects that you were putting <laughs> under the, the microscope figuratively and literally? God, I, yeah, I was a super science nerd growing up. Um, because like, I, all I want to do is program computers. From the day I discovered a computer that was programmable like that, I mean, if you want to picture me as a kid, as that like, you know, nerdy guy in the basement, in their parents' basement, like programming computers 24-7, like, that was me. But that was not socially acceptable to do like, at that time. So I had to kind of squeeze programming in between my other like, more acceptable nerdy hobbies. Like, they were all more science and math oriented. So I was doing Science Olympiad and math, what was that math decathlon thing called? And um, all kinds of like, quiz and just like the things that like nerdy high school students did um, at that time. So yeah, and, the, and the, the Greater San Diego Science and Engineering Fair, I was on the like whatever like student board committee thing of that because I like, was like super into it and um, I did an experiment one year. My, I, I did a lot of experiments that involved secondhand smoke and tobacco smoking. That was back when smoking regulation was starting to be a thing and my, my parents are doctors and so like it was a natural uh, thing for me to learn about. So yeah, that was, that was science geeky me. So now you're taking that science geeky you, it's 2009, you're writing this book. Anything you'd kind of change? Oh man, so many things. I mean, if you, like, I, I decided to keep all of my old blog posts up online, which those of you who are writers know like, how painful that is actually. It's like to go back and, you, so you can just, you go back and like read, what was I saying in 2009? And you'd be like, who is this idiot? I mean, really, there's so many things I wrote back then that are so primitive by today's standards. Like what? Um, Give us an example or two. Also like, go, so, so the very first blog post I ever wrote using the phrase Lean Startup, whatever that was, 2008, 2009, sometime in there. I mean, I was literally just like, I was, went home one day and was like, I've been thinking about this thing. The blog post was like, I've been thinking about this new thing. And I don't know if we should call it Lean Startup or Agile Startup or whatever. I think Lean Startup could be it. And it's, I used to talk about it as a combination of Agile software development and customer development and um, what I was calling at that time high leverage technology platforms or some other phrase that didn't catch on. Uh, and if you go read my blog from that time, like I had all kinds of ideas and buzzwords that did not catch on. Like, you know, it was customer validation that helped me understand that Lean Startup was a thing when these other things were really uh, quite stupid. And, and, and there's still a lot of people who talk about Lean Startup that way. It's just a little bit of this, a little bit of that, kind of mix them in a pot and, and stir it. And I think that's still better than what came before. So I'm, if that's how you want to interpret it and do it, God bless. But I think the way that we as a community talk about it now and that kind of integration of a kind of more like really scientific approach, the, the integration with the other pieces of the business. I was talking about software at those times, but now to understand how it relates to finance and accounting, how it relates to supply chain. And I mean, the sophistication we have is all, is all really different. But here's the thing, here's what I've learned about this. There's really different levels of understanding of something like Lean Startup. And if you insist, as the purists do, that only the most sophisticated level of understanding is legitimate, you actually prevent people ever from getting started. So I probably wouldn't change the book and my old blog post to incorporate what I know now because probably what I would have written would have seemed impenetrably confusing to people at that time. So like I'll give you my, one of my favorite examples. Every once in a while now, someone will hector me in the audience uh, because I use the term hypothesis incorrectly. And I've obviously never read Karl Popper and I don't understand what a falsifiable hypothesis is. And many other startups are using it incorrectly and as the Pope of Lean Startup, could I please excommunicate those people? Or like maybe I'm a fraud and I should excommunicate myself. But in any event, everyone should know to only do a fraud. And like, I totally hear that. But I work with a lot of teams whose level of understanding is not sophisticated enough for that yet. You know, so like as a coach, as a, as a teacher, when I work with teams, I'm always trying to calibrate what's the level of understanding of Lean Startup that they can understand? And if all it is is like take my spec sheet for my product and cut it in half and that's my minimum viable product, let's see what happens. If that's all they can do, then that's, if they're sincerely trying and that's the best they can do, then like, then I'll go with that. Because all scientific theories, what they have in common is their self-teaching. The whole point of making predictions and then having them turn out to be wrong and having that like oh shit moment and like trying to learn from that 
it allows you to deepen your own understanding without having to necessarily read it in a book. And that, I think back to my like, science education. Most science education sucks because we teach people that science means this like rote thing. You're like, first you state the problem statement, then you write down your hypothesis, and they, do you ever learn science that way? Like, it was many years later when I was like, oh, you could use it to discover something new? It didn't even occur to me. I, I thought all the discoveries had already been made, and my job was like to rote recreate them, like, you know, just like it says in the science textbook. Um, so, and then once you start to actually do science for real, you realize that like how it looks in the book is not actually very accurate at all. Like theoretically, that's what's happening, but a lot of people start their scientific inquiry not by like formally stating a really beautiful popper style falsifiable hypothesis, but just being like, I wonder what happens if I tinker with this and mess around with this and kind of figure stuff out. And like, and what what matters is not did you follow the process, but do you have the frame of mind to be truly authentically curious about what works and what doesn't work, and then to direct your inquiry to where you're wrong and where things are unexpected going badly. And that, I think that's very counter to human nature. We tend to want to focus on the things we're doing well. But the lesson of science is like focus on the things that are not going well, the things that are not living up to what you believe because that's the opportunity to learn. And when you translate that into a business context, it means don't, don't bullshit yourself that everything's going great in your startup. Or I'm sure your startup is fine, but in your friend's startup. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of things going well. There are a lot of numbers that are up and to the right, but don't, don't be satisfied with that. Like, ask yourself, is the startup really playing out the way that I thought? Is my strategy actually right? And if it's not, what needs to change? And like, have that be the area of focus. That, to me, that, that mindset is more important than any specific process or, or tactic. So I'll make an admission, not that we're in any kind of confessional sense here, but <laughs> having done, uh, you know, I run a product agency now, I ran an agency a while ago, but in between, I raised a million five, probably heard this story, um, did a lot of uh, big design up front, stealth, multiple platforms, couldn't tell anybody, and one of the things I do well is engage the press and told the story, and one of the metrics I was very proud of was how many people wrote about the fact that we were doing this really cool, interesting thing. And then we submitted to a lot of award categories, and what we were doing was really creative, and you know we were using some CGI and avatars. Um, and then it turned out great, and you made a ton of money, right? No, I'm yeah. here now. Just kidding. Um, just kidding. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I know that no, story but, so well. But understanding vanity metrics versus real metrics. So it, it's not about awards. It's not about TechCrunch writing about you. What what are the more substantive me metrics? And then what are some vanity metrics that could you know go either way that may yeah. actually indicate like a real signal in the market. I mean, people people think the word van, the phrase vanity metrics is is meant as a diss or some kind of negative thing. And you know, I mean, I think there are people who misuse it. But like people forget the purpose of vanity metrics. Like to me, the purpose of vanity metrics are the numbers you put in your press release, so that when TechCrunch reprints them verbatim, and your competitors read about them, they want to kill themselves. <laughs> that's, that's a good use of vanity metrics. Like, you make your competitors want to die. It's like, we don't have nearly what that's made. I used to work in a startup, i just give this example, where one of our competitors was, was the master of vanity metrics. And they used to put out a stat that was, what is the gross domestic product equivalent of all of the, like, user-to-user -user interactions on their social platform? Which is like, if you know anything about what GDP means in the economic, like, it's ludicrous. It makes no sense. It's just like... But it allowed them to take their like revenue number and like multiply it by this crazy phantom like polynomial expansion factor and produce a like massive number and then they'd be like, our economy is bigger than such and such company or country. Then and you'd be like, wow, it'd be amazing. And I remember we used to read these press releases and we sit in a board every time they did this. They'd be, we'd be in a board meeting and some board member would be like, so what's our GDP? <laughs> and I would be like, excuse me, sir, but that is a meaningless statistic. Da 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 da. You should really focus on. And they'd be like, yeah, yeah that's true, that's true, that's true, but. What is it? Anyway. <laughs> but anyway, what, what would ours be? And you'd be like, is, they're just like, you're just like oh, I just want to kill myself because there's no way like, theirs is bigger than ours. And what's nice about it from a competitive point of view is they've been able to put out all, this, all these metrics about their business and no one has a clue whether the business is actually any good or not. Like, they could easily have reported how much money they make and what their margins are and what their revenue per customer was. But they didn't want to reveal that information. That would help their competitors like me. I was dying to know that information. Now you ask yourself, why would the press print information that has no substantive content to it? It's like not helpful to anybody. I don't know if maybe you can ask someone from the press that question. I certainly don't know. But the problem, so, so using vanity metrics to make your competitors want to commit suicide, thumbs up. Using them yourself to evaluate your own progress is the problem. Hmm. So, you know, when you start to look at hits and total number of messages sent, any kind of gross quantity that's up and to the right, my personal favorite chart of all time is, you know, any kind of cumulative number. So like total registered users, a number that can only go up and to the right by definition. 
So it can never go down. So that's like produces beautiful charts that makes you feel really good about yourself. Like as soon as you start to use those to evaluate progress, you're in real trouble. Because you can't, if the gross quantities are changing, you'll never really know what caused the change. So I meet teams all the time, I meet startups constantly, and I ask them, how's it going? We're kill Everyone's always killing it, always. Okay, how do you know it's going so well? And like, I talk to an engineer, and they'll say, last month, we released this amazing feature, and this month, everything's up and to the right, so we're killing it. And I talk to someone in marketing, they're like, we did this amazing marketing campaign last month. This month, everything's up and to the right, we're killing it. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. I have an alternate theory. I heard that Mercury was in retrograde last month. And my astrologer said that all numbers go up and to the right when that happens. So I think that's why your numbers are up and to the right. And when I say that kind of thing to people, they get pretty pissed. They're like, how dare you accuse me of astrology? And I'm like, oh my, excuse me. Our theories have the same explanatory power, but you live here. I'm just visiting, who cares what I, random thing I think, but you don't have any clue. And in fact, every department in this company thinks that they're the one who made the numbers go up and to the right. So not only do you not know what's going on, not only are you completely, like you have a, you total distance and misunderstanding of your customers, if you all had the same misunderstanding, it wouldn't be so bad. But you're allowing every department in the company to live in their own private reality where the things that I do go up. Because what happens when the numbers go down? Anyone ever ask someone what's wrong when the numbers go down? It's always seasonal factors. You ever hear seasonal factors make the number? You ever hear someone be like, we're killing it this quarter, but it's because of seasonal factors? Nothing we did. Never, but like when it's down, oh, it's seasonal factors. Or like, we did this awesome new feature in engineering, but those idiots in marketing like messed up the PR for it or whatever. So like, so if it's good, it's my, it's me, if it's bad. So like, no wonder these departments become like, you know, opposed to each other and start to feel like they're, we're the smart people and they're stupid people. So like, like all that is simply vanity metrics run amok. So if, you're, if you want to use real metrics, all you need to do at the like basic level is denominate things on a per customer basis. So like we tell you that metrics are people too. So whole numbers of human beings, not gra gross quantities of things. And like ask yourself, what percentage of customers in this cohort did the activity I really care about? And the nice thing about those metrics is they're the same when you have 100 customers, it's when you have 1,000, it's when you have 10,000, and when you eventually have a million customers, it'll be the same. Like, we need to know what's the conversion rate, what is the revenue per customer, what is the lifetime value per customer. Like, the things that don't change as scale changes are the numbers that really can help guide uh, whether you're truly making progress. Because the truth is, most product teams that I meet, if you look at their progress cohort after cohort, you can be like, here's five releases of this product. Revenue per customer, conversion rates, they're all basically unchanged over this period. So my question is, if you're making the product better, but all the per customer numbers are the same, how is it better? I understand maybe it's prettier. I understand maybe it makes you happier when you look at it. But is that the business that we're in? Are we in the business of like self-satisfied looking at our own product to think that it's great? Maybe, maybe there's such a business. I, now I'm like always nervous, like maybe someone that's their startup. <laughs> but I think most of us believe that our products have an impact out in the world. And if that impact is an improving version after version, change after change, then our understanding of what the word quality means is wrong. And if you don't know what quality means, then you can't judge whether you're making the product better or worse. And a lot of people right now, I'm sure not at your company, but at your at friend's company that's all messed up, they are actually busy right now making their product worse. And you know, it's like, if you wanna be more efficient in the way they work, how about a place to start? Don't do that anymore. That's all I'm trying to say. So on that note, we're going to turn over to Q&A. We're going to do a little bit from the live stream, and then we'll kind of throw to the mics around here. Um, first question comes from Paul. Hey, Paul. <laughs> Seems that the starting point of startups is having some sort of problem to solve that's worth solving. But what can you do when you don't have a first idea? So first of all, one controversy that has erupted lately is about whether it's correct to talk about the, to use the phraseology of problem solution, because you're like, well, what problem does like a great movie solve? Or like what problem, does certain, like entertainment product, what problem are they solving? And it's like, people get caught up in that language. You know, I do use that, that framework myself, but I'm not ideological about it. What matters is not that you have a problem that you want to solve, but that you have some kind of theory, some kind of belief about how the world could be better because of your startup. If you don't have a good idea, like, don't do a startup just to do a startup. I know that's really popular right now, but like I really think it's a bad idea. If your goal is just to get rich or like to be famous, like you see, like it's a, there's so many better, I mean, we're in New York, so it's like this is like the capital of ways to get rich without having to work that hard. Like, <laughs> go, go do that. I mean, it's Zing. way. And you're no, from SF, right? I live in San Francisco. I think, I think well, we we do that pretty well, right too, to be honest, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but like, startup is not a good way to get rich. So that if you actually do the math on what your probability of something good happening to you is by doing startup, like, not a good plan. 
Um, if you really want to learn about startups and you're, and you're interested in startup and entrepreneurship itself, go work at a startup that's well run and see, like meet, if you never met a real startup visionary in your life, like go meet such a person. Uh, and not someone who plays startup visionary on TV. You know, that's all, I, I meet a lot of people now who like wear the black turtleneck and like they put on a good show of what a visionary they are, but it's like, have you built a visionary company yourself? Who are some visionaries you'd go, want to go work for if you were in that kind of a situation? Oh, all the okay. same people you admire. I read the same TechCrunch articles that you do, and, and the less you know about a company, the more admirable it seems, generally. So like, the problem is all the companies I know really well, like I go behind the firewall and I'm like, oh shit, like, stuff's happening here. Like, when you read about it in the press, it just seems like, wow, this person, like, straight from their mind, you know, Steve Jobs did this thing. Um, and so like, but honestly, like, if you have a chance to do Y Combinator, to work at a Y Combinator company, or any kind of like elite, venture back, like, it's a great experience, go do it, like, see what it's like uh, under the firewall, like, don't be making your career and, like, personal aspiration decisions based on, like, what you saw in a movie or, like, what you read on TechCrunch, like, d d don't read science fiction and think that's how the world is. I made that mistake, it was very, very painful. <laughs> but if you, but my guess is anyone who would ask a question, I'm not trying to think, like, what's Paul really asking, okay? Here's my guess. I don't know you, Paul, you're on a live stream, so I don't even know where, I know nothing about you, but I have a guess about you. I bet you do have an idea, and you're too scared to say it out loud, because it seems really stupid, or it would be too small, or like there's some voice in your head that's like, Steve Jobs wouldn't have that idea, or whatever, like you have some like narrative, because like, why are you asking this question? If you don't have an idea, and like well then why are you interested in entrepreneurship? Like, I'm just like, so I'm guessing that you do have an idea, that there's something about this world that you, bothers you uniquely, and it might be something really stupid, you know, it might be something really small or whatever. It might just be that, like, there's no way to poke someone online at your college campus. And that's okay. <laughs> like, I would rather, if, like, I, rather than you do something that you think is serious. Remember, I was so obsessed as a college student trying to do a startup. I wanted to have a real business that seemed serious and, like, I didn't even know. I didn't know what that meant, but I wanted it to be, like, real. Don't do something real. Do something stupid. Do something that you actually care about that solves a problem that you personally care about. And the number of entrepreneurs I meet who are doing a startup and you ask them like, why did you get into this business in the first place? Why, why are you doing this? They're like, well, what I really care about is this other thing. But I've like talked myself into this ridiculous story where like in order to get to this product that I really want to build, I first have to build this product and then I have to get credibility and I need a lighthouse customer and I read this and I'm going this like crazy alternate. And you're like, is there a more direct path from where you are now to there? And it's like, well, I'd have to like say my crazy idea out loud and I'm scared. So Paul, I don't know you. <laughs> and I don't mean to call you a coward because I, we met on a live stream and you asked me this question. But I just, I feel like I know what you're going through. And if that resonates with you or with someone else who's listening, like my advice would be just do it. Give yourself a deadline. What, what day of the week is it today? I don't even know. Thursday. 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 So two Thursdays from now, first MVP done. Customer feedback acquired. Like make your decision then about whether you think it's actually a stupid idea or not. And I think what you'll find is if something's really bothering you, if something has emotional resonance with you, it probably has with other people too. Like we're not actually as different from other people as we think and therefore that intuition you have about like this sucks, it shouldn't be this way, um, there's probably a business idea there. That's great. Here in the audience? Here we go. Hi. Uh, I was wondering when you think about technology companies in particular, do you see a difference in how your methodologies, the process, the frameworks, etc. Is applied in businesses that may fit more of a SaaS kind of model, certainly, versus companies that you might define as being more network oriented, right? Um, yeah, building ecosystems, etc., and and maybe you know some of the differences that you're seeing there. Yeah, uh, every company that that uses these ideas makes it their own, and in fact, um, it's not even called lean startup at most companies that are really advocates of lean startup. They generally will build a company specific, you know management system, and I encourage that. I think that's really smart. You know, at GE, it's called Fastworks. At Intuit, it's, it's called Design for Delight. Um, I won't name the company, but there's a very large and famous tech company that has like a secret lean startup meetup that I get together with every once in a while, and it's people who have realized that the company is such a non-invented here place that if they go around saying lean startup minimum viable product, their colleagues like get all, you know, like, oh, that's stupid. But if they like come up with company specific lingo that means the same thing and they pretend that it was invented there like it, people are actually very excited about it so I think that's great you know I always remind people that lean manufacturing which came out of, out of Toyota 
It's not called lean manufacturing at Toyota. That was an academic phrase that came up later. It's called the Toyota production system. And that allows them to make it their own and to evolve it over time. They don't have to go get some academic's permission to like evolve their own production process. That would be you know, pretty stupid. So um, got to make it your own. Now, for companies that have different kind of fundamental strategies, right? Like you have the businesses that are based on large quantities of time and attention that they're going to monetize through advertising. You have the businesses that are like based on some kind of like lock-in or network effect, some kind of sticky long-term retention type business. Businesses that are fundamentally about paid advertising and um, making rev you know, more revenue per customer than you spend on advertising. Like those are really different kinds of businesses and they tend to be very specialized. It's like picking a major. Like they tend to be really good at the thing that they do. So their implementation of Lean Startup generally will reflect that. You know, you think about businesses where really all they care about is getting to that critical mass of unlocking the network effect. People talk about critical mass and network effects like it's a binary thing. Because when you look at the vanity metrics, it really is. It's like flat, 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 boom. And, and like the metaphor of critical mass is like one of the more famous exponential physical processes that we have ever unlocked. What people don't realize, or they don't think about, I think they know this at some level, is that the critical mass and the, and the network effect is, is happening during the flat part of the hockey stick too. It's just, it's an exponential growth on a very small base. So the, the specialty in those kind of companies is learning to really measure on a per customer basis, is the network effect getting stronger for the participants in the network. That kind of expertise and like, you know, viral loop mechanics and engagement, like all that kind of stuff is like so different than like a consumer packaged goods company where the expertise is about segmentation and advertising production and you know, profitable customer acquisition. So like the, so if you imagine those like two really different businesses, different business models, different business specialties, the kinds of A-B tests they're doing, the kinds of metrics they use, it's, like, it's really wildly different. And if you just try to take the playbook from one company and put it into another, you'd kill it instantly. It's like a DNA transplant, it doesn't work. Um, but most of those companies have like made it their own through their own process of learning and discovery versus they like went and got the like SaaS lean startup book and like learned it from that or whatever. Is that helpful? So we have a question from Michelle. I'm going to throw it through the, the lens of, of kind of the straight out of Compton. So to quote Jay-Z, if you want my old shit, buy my old album. Your old album's out here. Yeah. What's the new album? What's up next? What have you been working on in the, in the uh, studio? Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. So someone was complaining to me the other day that there's nothing new in Lean Startup. It's kind of ossified and born. It's a, you know, an OG person who's been in Lean Startup community for a long time. And they're like, where's the big new idea? And I'm like... Do you know how long it took me to develop Lean Startup? Like, I can't come out with a new idea that good every year. I, I just can't. Like, it, it takes a long time. So software out um, or the sophomore album is always a, a tough one, right? Yeah. Well, and plus the pressure. <laughs> Everyone, you know, it's like, oh my god, my people from my publisher are here, and they're like all excited for the next book. And, and I, yeah, don't worry, it's gonna be a huge hit, I'm sure. But yeah. but what is the next book, and what what yeah, drove so, you so to write it? I, I did so, and, and it was it's my publisher's fault actually because they really you know. Um, wanted me to do it, you know, for obvious reasons. And I was like, writing a book is so painful, I never want to do it again, like, no way, I'm not going to do it. And, and eventually they uh, kind of helped me come around to the idea that maybe there was something, something to say. And the reason, the, like, the thing that kind of clinched it for me, I said, okay, maybe there is another book to write here, is I remember, I used to try to convince companies to do Lean Startup one at a time. I mean, literally, the early days, I was in, you know, I would go in and try to become an advisor to startups and I would sit there with this team and it was just me and them. There was no lean startup movement, no community, no nothing. And I'm like, you should do continuous deployment instead of a you know, quarterly release cycle or monthly release cycle for your software. And they'd be like, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. And then it's like, talk about facing the firing squad. It's like, okay, well, let's, it's like, it's, that's how you find out if you really know what you're talking about. You try to convince them to do something different. And I learned, you know, I, and they would ask me questions. The first time someone asked me, lean startup in a SaaS business, I was like, I don't know anything about that. First time I got asked, you know, lean startup, you know, how does it relate to this or that? And there was a big thing for a while about, can it work in B2C and B2B? And like, what are, what are the differences? And you know, like, I had to figure that stuff out. And it got to a point after a, a year or two where I started to get the same questions over and over again. And I was like, oh, these used to be hard questions, but I know the answer now. So then I was like, is it actually the most efficient way to give people the answer like one person at a time? <laughs> like, maybe not. That's ultimately what led to writing the book. And I was like, oh, that's very efficient. I can tell you know, a couple hundred thousand people uh, the answer at the same time. And now that's starting to happen to me again. Like as I've done more and more of this work, bringing this into two really different contexts. Two things that, the two contexts that people say have nothing in common, I think are more similar than we realize. I get brought into super, becoming, you talk a little bit about GE and 
uh, some, you know, into it, these very big companies. I got brought back into Toyota. That was a big honor for me to do lean startup at Toyota. That was like, wow. Um, done it in the federal government and they, all these big bureaucratic organizations, trying to help them get to a more entrepreneurial state. And then there's a second community of people who were like early adopters of lean startup who were really into the like MVPs and pivots and whatnot in the early days. And I remember, I, I've been talking about this for many years now as a system of entrepreneurial management. And like, in the early days of Silicon Valley, people were like, yeah, yeah, whatever, management, blah, blah, blah. Tell me about that MVP thing again. And I was fine with that at the time. I, mean, I was just like, hey, anyone wants to listen to me about anything, that's great. Now, some of those people, their companies were like three people then are, you know, 500, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 employees now. And a number of those people have gotten back in touch to say, hey, can we, can we have that management conversation again? Because um, I'm a great entrepreneur myself, but I have all these people working for me and they don't have the same entrepreneurial instincts that I do. And it's frustrating to me. They're doing these waterfall plans or they don't get customers involved. Like they don't understand what it was like to be an entrepreneur. And I'm like, well, right, because you've built this nice antique 20th century org chart for them that has them working in their functional silos. And it looks, you know, no offense, but it looks just like Alfred Sloan would have said in 1925. So I thought you were a cutting edge, cool startup. What happened to that? And it gets a little uncomfortable, but then we can actually have a conversation about what would it look like to build an organization that was built to learn, built for continuous innovation, um, so that you can not just be the entrepreneur who had that one good idea at that one time, you can have a whole company of entrepreneurs working for you and helping you as a company come up with many, many good ideas over, over the long term. Those two problems are more similar than anybody realizes. And the conversations I have in those two contexts are really similar. And the first time people ask me like, okay, well, how do you do the HR policy for people who are working on entrepreneurial way? What should it say on their business card? How do you fund those teams? How do you do the accounting? How do you deal with, you know, um, you know, what do you do about software capitalization? What do you do about uh, ROI projections? What do you report to the street? How do you deal with, you know, like I said, how do you deal with supply chain and legal and compliance? Like, those questions used to be really difficult to me and it used to be really hard. And now it's gotten to the point where I keep getting asked those same questions over and over again. And I was like, oh yeah, maybe teaching companies about this one at a time is not the most efficient. And I was like, I remember that feeling. Like, okay, so maybe there is something to write. So I, my hope is to distill that experience and that kind of broadening of the framework of these other use cases into a book about, um, you know, what is the blueprint for a truly modern company? Like, if you really think about what a 21st century company should look like, does it really make sense that it should, should, it, should it be something that Alfred Sloan would recognize? Should it be like something that Fred Taylor would be like, oh yeah, one of those, I, I did that in 1911. Like, I don't think so. I think it should be something that really feels contemporary and that really is designed, tuned to the market conditions that we all find ourselves in. And, so something like that. So in addition to the continuous innovation components and the HR and the culture, is there a morality to a lean startup oriented, you know, is, it, is there something around diversity or some of these things that are brought up uncomfortably in the tech industry in particular? Is there something about that future state of a company that looks more and reflects more its customers? When I, when I get on roll and start talking, I forget yeah. that there's thousands <laughs> of people on the live stream and they're probably yeah. on Twitter like, <laughs> Whenever I start talking about meritocracy and diversity, like nothing I talk about in all of this is more controversial than that and gets me in more trouble. Like every time I open my mouth on this topic, like my inbox gets flooded with people in Silicon Valley who are pissed at me. But, so I'm just being a little careful about what I say. People ask, is Silicon Valley a meritocracy or not? Or like, is the startup community, the tech industry a meritocracy or not? And that's like such a dumb question to me, like that it could be binary. Like there is such a thing as a meritocracy and you either above the bar or below the bar. Like that doesn't make sense. Obviously it's a spectrum and you can get, you can be more or less meritocratic. So I, look, I am very grateful to the tech industry and all that it has given me in my career. I think that it is more meritocratic than a lot of other industries, not to name any names, but you know who I'm talking about. Uh, and we have a lot to be proud of. And yet if you look at the design of our companies and the way that we operate, there's like obvious and glaring bugs in the meritocratic system. There's bias that is so evident, I, don't, I can't even believe it's controversial to talk about it. But even with customer validation, thinking yeah. about how important is it that the customers that you serve are also reflected within your management? You're thinking about women making 90% what of could the be more purchase obvious? decisions. I mean, yeah. And what's so weird to me is, look at the academic literature. It's not like this is not a problem that has been studied with scientific rigor. The literature on this topic is incredibly clear that diverse teams make better decisions, um, that People who make snap decisions make them in a biased and therefore like less effective way. And that companies, you know, companies with more diverse boards perform better. I mean, it's like, we could go, I mean, if you haven't consulted that literature or if it's bothering you to talk about it, then like, then you're anti-science. So 
be quiet. That's not my, <laughs> my feeling about it. Like, go read. Go become educated. And like, my, my inbox gets flooded with people who are like, but I have some theory about why all that science is wrong. And it's like, you know what? It's just very unlikely that you in your basement came up with this, like, the one thing that all these brilliant researchers have all missed. And like, if that's true, go run your own experiments. Like, go prove your crazy point with your own science. Like, it's not good enough for us to sit around and be like, it just doesn't seem right to me. Seems like our company should all look like this homogenous way. And you know, it's just, ugh. What, what is interesting, though, is that that, that whole debate, is because it's so emotional and it's political and, it's, and people have a vested interest in not changing and all the reasons, it gets very far from solutions and into this like philosophical discussion. I mean, the, I made the mistake of criticizing Y Combinator back in the day. And the number of people that came out of the woodwork to just be like, let me explain to you why it has to be this way and only this way. Um, was and what is, what is the way, what did you criticize? Uh, I was like, it can't be right that 95% of founders are white men. And in fact, Y Combinator's done an amazing job of diversifying who they fund. And it hasn't been the end of YC. And, but, like, but the claim at those days is that those people don't exist. There aren't female founders and minority founders for us to invest in. And I was like, it's because they don't apply to your program because they think correctly that they wouldn't be admitted. So how is that controversial? It seems like pretty, like pretty basic to me anyway. Um, I got drawn into those debates, and I was debating with people in theory, like, do, do these people exist? And it's just like, it's a very uh, counterproductive way to spend energy. Instead of saying, well, what, what are the most meritocratic decision-making mechanisms that have been studied and that we've learned about? And that brings it back to Lean Startup. My experience has been, as we get more scientific in our decision-making, we have less bias. Hmm. So going back to that funding, we we'll asked the investment question. Um, if we make our investment decisions based on snap judgments, and I've seen this actually more in corporate environments than in the VC world, because VC is still very gut oriented, but a lot of companies have adopted some form of innovation accounting and they're starting to be more rigorous about which of our innovation teams are actually delivering results and learning about customers. And what you discover is the people who can put on the best show for management of how great they are tend to look a certain way and tend to come from a very specific kind of background that aligns with the culture of the company. And resources flow to those people in like the most old school, non-meritocratic way possible. And when you shine a light on that, you realize, wait a minute, we're starting to fund people who we didn't even know worked here. You know, like they would have been here this whole time, but we didn't, you know, we, they didn't look the part. They didn't put on the right, they didn't wear the right kind of turtleneck. And so we didn't see them as visionary, but when we adopt more incremental funding mechanisms, we can be more democratic about how many experiments we run. As we more rigorous in how we evaluate progress, we start to realize that the people doing the work are often quite uh, a little bit quiet. They're not out there bragging about what a great job they're doing. They're just quietly getting things done for customers. We can promote and reward those people. They're do um, leaders. They're not thought leaders, right? They might just yeah. be doing. Yeah, oh, we were talking before, but I hate the term thought leader because it's like, I would yeah. make all of you thought followers. <laughs> like, hi, thought followers. Like, thank you for, it's like, yeah. what kind of a dumb yeah. phrase is that anyway? I think we want to do one more audience question and then okay. call it an evening. I think from this side of the room. Oh, okay. balance Oh, that side. That side's better. We, we did one guy. Maybe we have one gal. Okay. All right. Maybe not. <laughs> Can I go first? Okay. Great. Um, so, Eric, I I am still reading your book, and absolutely love it. And this is going to be a really um, heady question. So please help me break it down for everybody else. Um, so in your book, you talk about foresight, ability, and tools. Sorry, and talk about what? Foresight, ability, and tools. Okay. And that it, you mentioned that it's really helpful for entrepreneurs to really think about, you know, strategically um, having the right foresight and really being careful about the talent that they're sourcing and the tools that they're choosing. And I'm completely in agreement with that. Um, and you also mentioned today the importance of avoiding consequential strategic errors. Yeah. So naturally now I'm thinking, oh, okay, so I've got a little formula going on here. Can you talk to us more about that? That is a big topic. Sorry. Um, no, <laughs> help, me. It, help me out. So yeah, so let's talk about strategy. Um, I was read, when I was doing the research for Lean Startup, I read a lot of books. I was just like, I'm going to read as many business books as I possibly can to make sure that what I'm saying is new and original and not just some retread of something. Like tons of things that I thought were like my great original idea. I'm like, like there's like 50 books about that already. So like, what am I going to tell people how to do that better than these other books? Like, no, I'll just link to those books and read them instead. And I had never really encountered corporate strategy before. So I read all, I read the Michael Porter books on corporate strategy and, and I read everything I could. I thought strategy was a fascinating discipline and I'll never forget, I was reading one of those famous books. I think it was a Michael Porter book and there's a in the middle of a like, you know, multi hundred page tome. It says, remember when you're formulating a corporate strategy until you've proven it in the real world, it's just a theory. So don't forget the testing part. 
And I was like, finally, the chapter on testing I've been waiting for, like, turn the page. It's like, next chapter, other, it's like, that's it. One <laughs> sentence, you should make sure to do this. And I was like, well, how do I do that? And it was considered like too obvious to even say how to do it. And so no, there was like nothing about that. And that helped me understand like why we have so many strategy errors. We're used, like we, we've grown up with and, and the 20th century gave us companies that like really succeeded through analysis and through like a much more predictable future than we are accustomed to. And so coming up with the right strategy was a matter of like finding the right principles and applying them in a rigorous way. But I think that we have to understand strategy in a different way. We have to understand strategy as a series of strategic hypotheses, if-then statements, right? Like the strategy says, if the market looks like this, then this entity will have the supplier power, and we want to have this kind of relationship with them. But it doesn't say that that supplier will have power. It says, if these other things are true, then this follows. So that allows us to then formulate experiments. Like, let's go find out if that's really true. First of all, those, in fact, the players. And as we start to do that more and more, we realize that a lot of the things we need to know are actually not about the world as it exists today, but the world as it might exist if we do something, right? Because the, the strategy really is, if we come out with a certain product, or if we change our pricing like this, or if we form this kind of partnership, then the other players will react in this way. So how can we figure that out? How those become like the, the fodder for new experiments to do. And maintaining that framework, that like whatever our strategic framework is, it's about like suggestions of things to test is really hard to do, especially as you get more successful. So I'll just give you one more little tip. I used to be, um, you know, I'm not, I, I have a well-apportioned a well ego, and you know, I'm a relatively arrogant person. And I think I know best when I meet people. It's like very hard for me to train myself not to be like, someone comes with their startup idea and just like give them a snap judgment about that's a dumb idea, or that's bad, you know, whatever. And for a long time, the problem I had was people would pitch me a startup and I would say, that strategy is incoherent. Don't you know anything about, theory, like technology lifecycle adoption curve, haven't you read the, the innovator's dilemma, and don't you know about this, and you, you have made a strategic error in this plan, it can never work, you know, you're screwed, start over. And my success rate at getting entrepreneurs to change their strategy based on my brilliant analysis of all the things they're doing wrong is exactly 0%. <laughs> I am batting exactly 0, 0, 0, I have never succeeded even one time in getting an entrepreneur to reconsider their strategy based on some argument about what I read in a book sometime, because Everyone thinks their strategy is brilliant. And what I have learned the really hard way is it doesn't matter if things like formally seem like they uh, fit the strategy pattern. First of all, some people don't even understand their own strategy. So what, the way they describe it is just wrong. What, they, what their customer's experience is not what they think they're doing. Some of these strategic frameworks are limited. They're not universally correct and they can be wrong. And then things change. Some of these frameworks were true in the past, they're not true anymore. So you gotta be humble about that. Instead. If you think someone's made a strategic error, the obligation is on you to help them discover that for themselves. That's what led me to the concept of minimum viable product, was like, I'm working with teams, and I need to get them to try something to see if they're right. And I'll just tell you one example. Go back to the theme of meeting people where they are and the level of sophistication that they have. I was working with a team that was adamant that their product was amazing, and they were gonna sell it at this trade show and do this big PR hoopla at the trade show and get all these orders, and I was like, You've never talked to a customer. You have no idea what you're talking about. Know, you're making, and, then like, and there were like four strategic errors at once. I was like, this is really, team's really bad. And they were just like, nope, nope, super clear they're gonna do it. And I tried all the arguments from the book, leap of faith assumptions, and all of a sudden they're like, nope, 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 nope. And I said, finally, I was like, okay, how about this? Since you're right, this trade show is gonna be a big success. Could each of you on this three by five index card write down for me how many orders you're gonna get? And we're gonna put that in an envelope. And this, this, is a, this is all I could get them to do. Everyone wrote down, one person's like, we're gonna get 1,000 orders, other person's like, we're gonna get 5,000. Everyone put their, their prediction of what was gonna happen in an envelope, stuck in an envelope, and we sealed it, we wrote the date on the envelope, and then I said, let's meet after the trade show. And they were just like, that meeting was a waste of time, that guy's an idiot, you know. But they agreed to meet with me after the trade show. And will you be shocked to hear that they didn't make any sales at the trade show? You know, like, not that they only made a couple, or like it was only 3,000 but not 5,000 as they were, but like they made zero, so you, you know the story, right? So in the second meeting, they're like, whoa, something's gone horribly wrong. If they hadn't written it down, I'm convinced they would have done what we all do, which is they would have retroactively declared success and made the metric something else, not sales, but like, well, we got really great engagement with the press, or you know, this other thing was really, and they would have, but because they wrote it down, and we had the meeting, like we opened the envelope and looked at the card, they're like, how is it possible that we were so stupid that we thought this was gonna happen and it didn't? And now they start to say, you know, maybe our strategy's not right. 
Right? They start to explore the possibility, and they're like, maybe we should be a little bit more rigorous in defining our experiment next time. So now, instead of me coming in and telling them the answer, they're discovering the answer for themselves. And what I have learned is that that is the better way for people to learn a new, way, new approach. It's just, that's just a better framework all around. And so as you are all in startups or in business, like you, you start applying this framework to yourself, but as you become more successful, you start to wind up applying it not just to yourself, but to your other fellow leaders and other folks, other teams that you work with and other people in your company. As the company grows, there's multiple teams and you start to realize that you not only have to be an entrepreneur, you have to be able to teach this to other people. And so these concepts that seem like kind of about management and coaching and teaching, they don't necessarily seem like they apply to you. Like, just like keep that in the back of your mind that one day you may find yourself in a situation like, oh yeah, that, that's something that I need to do. And I, I think it's a skill we all could work on developing. I know certainly for me, it's been very helpful. And, and quite unnatural, so quite difficult for me to, to figure it out. Well, I'm sure everybody has a startup they need to get home to and work on into the night. Yeah, get on it. Um, you're not our messiah, but you are a great do-leader, and we are so glad and looking forward to your next book. Thank you, Eric. Oh, thank you very much. Thank I you, everybody. It. Thank you.